Please be seated. And good to see you. Please turn to Revelation 21. Thank you so much to all of the readers today. Wasn't that beautiful? We've been in a series this fall called God of the Impossible, looking at all of the impossible things that God has done in salvation history. And today we're going to be looking at the new heavens and the new earth as the promise of Emmanuel, God with us, is realized. One of the greatest longings of the human heart is to return to Eden. Eden represents home, utopia, a paradise that we almost had, but it slipped away. And I was doing some research this week, and I found that different cultures have different words for this longing for paradise and for Eden. There's a Welsh word called hilaith, and that's commonly translated in English as homesickness, but it's a lot more than homesickness. It carries a sense of longing to be where your spirit lives. Hilaith is what you feel when you're separated from someone or something that once made you feel alive and connected, like a loved one that has passed, or your country of origin, or your culture, or the sweet years of your childhood. Some here have a hilaith for the kiva that we were in for seven years. There's a German word called fernvi. Fernvi is a feeling of homesickness, not for a place that you've been, but for a place that you've never been, a place that you long to be, that, you, that maybe you see a picture of it and you're like, that looks like home, that, that looks like the place that I belong in. And it makes your heart break when you think about it. Now, even beyond this is the Portuguese word saudade. And saudade is like when your heart breaks, when you think about all that you long for that you've never even seen before that you're heartsick and homesick for something beyond the horizon of reality. See, the longing that we have for paradise, for Eden, it's so powerful that it's painful. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's so powerful, the longing that we have for that paradise, that Eden, that home, that true sense of where we are truly alive. It's so powerful that it's painful, and there's two things that we can do with that pain. The first thing that we can do with that pain is what C.S. Lewis talked about in his book, The Weight of Glory, is that we get revenge on it by calling it nostalgia or by calling it adolescence and or romanticism. Even worse, though, is when rather than getting revenge on the pain that we feel, that longing that we feel, is that we take it with us and we get revenge on the world with it. We try to turn the world into the utopia that we long for. We try to recreate Eden and get everyone to cooperate with us. And usually, whether it's on a small scale or a large scale, whenever we try to recreate Eden with that longing, get revenge on the world, that doesn't end well either. It usually ends up hurting a lot of people. Now, the author from our reading today is the Apostle John. And he was writing this in one of the darkest moments of his life and how he probably longed for Eden, how he probably longed for home. And he got the vision of the true object of our longings for home the true object of our longing for, for our homesickness to be resolved, and that is Emmanuel, God with us. That is the only resolution to that longing that we have, the only resolution to that pain that we have that we carry, fulfilled in the new heavens and the new earth. Let's look there at this new home. What can we expect of this new home that God will provide for us? The first thing is that instead of a sea of separation, there will be a joyful marriage. Instead of a sea of separating, separating us from our loved ones and from God, there will be a joyful marriage. One of the first observations that John has of this new world is included in verse 1 when he says, the sea is no more. The sea is no more. Now, in biblical references, the sea carries lots of terrible connotations. It's a swampy cesspool of corruption. It's where the demonic lives. It's where oppression lives. It's where chaos lives. And also the sea in a world without airplanes and in a world with rudimentary boats, sea represented separation from your loved ones. Now you think about John. John's an older pastor at this point. His congregation is in Ephesus. John was imprisoned for his, leader, his Christian leadership and his faith in Jesus. And he was imprisoned on the island of Patmos. It was this island separated by miles and miles of sea, of the Aegean Sea. And so he is about 60 miles of seawater apart from his congregation at a very critical moment in their life. They were undergoing persecution under the Roman emperor Domitian. And Domitian was killing Christians, torturing Christians, 
harassing Christians, taking their stuff, taking their property. And John knows this is happening in Ephesus and he's separated from them. He cannot go there to be with them. All he can be with is with the Lord in this island of Patmos praying and God's giving him this vision where there's no sea anymore. There's no separation anymore from the people that he loves. We're not being persecuted, my friends, but we are separated. We have a sea of separation. Justin Whitmill early in his book on friendship describes a current of loneliness that pulls us further and further from each other without us even trying. He writes this, the drift of modern life is to become busier, wealthier people who used to have friends. And isn't that true? The Surgeon General recently named loneliness as America's number one health problem. You think about greater than heart disease, greater than cancer, loneliness as the number one health problem. 50% of American adults are lonely, have very few friends or no friends at all, and their mental health is deteriorating as a result. So what happens when this sea is taken away, this swamp of separation is no more? What takes its place? And what takes its place is a joyful marriage. Verse 2 describes the bride in this marriage. I also saw the holy city, John writes, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Have you ever seen a bride adorned for her husband walking into the church, processing down the aisle with the music playing? It, it's like breathtaking to see the bride walking down the aisle. And John sees the most beautiful bride making her appearance, and it's the new Jerusalem. She's adorned with glory and perfection. And the thing about this bride is that she is the most beloved bride that ever existed in the heaven and earth and all of human history. Here is the most beloved bride. And she's been through so much. Oh, my word. This bride has been through so much suffering, so much separation. She's cried so many tears, and here she is ready to be reunited with her groom. And verse 3 and 4 describes the groom's response to the bride. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne announcing this, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God and will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. My friends, God is ready in this moment to live in close proximity with his bride. Close proximity, it's one of the best parts of marriage, the everyday closeness that's possible. Sharing meals together, tackling problems together, comforting one another. But as also that close proximity usually comes with problems too, and that becomes an issue. And so the closest and most fulfilling marriages in this life, my friends, are but a faint shadow of the marriage to come. Because there will be an almost unfathomable proximity between God and his people. God with us. Just think about it. Imagine here we are in the new heavens and the new earth. And God's address is right here. He has an address. He comes to visit your house. You go to visit his house. Jesus is having a dinner party with some of his close friends. And you're invited. And it's, and it's one of the most fulfilling conversations that you've ever had. And some of the most delicious food that you've ever, that you don't want the night to end, but it ends. But guess what? There's more to come. Maybe Emmanuel, God with us, has a project that he's working on, turning swords into plowshares. And he invites you and your whole family to come help him turn the swords into plowshares and make peace in a world that has only known pain. And a bunch of other people have joined too. And you work on this project together and it's so joyful and so much fun. Or what about this? The Lord God wants to go on a hike through the lush green mountains and it's just that he just wants time just one on one just you and him and so you go on a hike and you hike and you walk for hours and you drink delicious water from the very clean river that's flowing right next to the hiking trail and you cook some fish and, and you have some of the best most healing conversations and you get to the end of it and you're like that was the best day of my life he like the he right of our hearts is for God to make his home with us. And my friend, that's what we're homesick for. We're always going to be homesick until we get there. I just love the image of the Lord God himself wiping away 
tears. You think about it's a pretty tender image there. If you think about who are you comfortable crying in front of? I'm comfortable crying in front of most people, but who are you comfortable crying in front of? That's a vulnerable thing. That means that there's a level of safety and tenderness that you have and proximity that you have with the Lord God, that you would shed tears in his presence, that we would shed tears in his presence. And it's even more tender that he would reach out his hand and put his hand on our cheek and take his thumb and wipe the tears away and not break eye contact. He's got all the time in the world for these kinds of conversations and for these type of healing moments. As long as it takes to heal is the time that he has to give. And there's no parting needed. The thing is that there's no goodbyes needed. And goodbyes are some of the hardest things. It's like the homesick thing. We know we have to say goodbye. And, And yet goodbyes are so painful. That's why reunions are so joyful. So this reunion, this wedding, is one of the most joyful things we could ever imagine. There's only joy and delight. And see, the Lord's going to tell us and he's going to show us in this time how he's making all things new. He's going to show us what all the suffering meant. He's going to show us what our sacrifices meant, what our communion meant, what everything we've done with Emmanuel looks like in the grand scheme of his grand kingdom of everything that we've been doing. John describes another change that we need to see, not just the sea of separation giving way to a joyful marriage, but also Instead of a temple and sun, the lamb will be our lamp. Instead of a temple and sun, the lamb will be our lamp. Verse 22, John says, I did not see a temple in it because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the lamb are its temple. Now, what's a temple? A temple is where heaven and earth overlap, where God dwells with humanity, where he forgives our sin, where he gathers us together, where where we hear his word, And like you want to connect with God, you want to have the communion that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden, you go to the temple. There you have your sins forgiven, and there you commune with him. Now, for ancient Jews, this involved sacrifice. Then it gave way to the synagogue, and through Jesus gave way to the church. And all these institutions are wonderful, beautiful places where heaven and earth overlap, and it's wonderful, but all of them have problems, right? The temple always had problems. You read the Old Testament, you're like, man, that thing is like an old Chicago house. It's necessary, but there's always something wrong with it. First of all, it's hard to get to. It's like one place in all the world. And it's wonderful to make a pilgrimage there, but like it's one place in all the world. And so it's limited. And then if there's human beings involved, there's sin involved and sometimes corruption involved. And and Jesus himself said, like, my father, this is my father's house. And it's, it's to be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves and robbers. And so there's always issues and problems with the temple. And we experience those issues and problems, don't we? Where it's like, why can't we be more of who we were created to be? And so there's no temple in this new heavens, but there's also no sun. You think about the sun. John says there's no need for a sun or a moon. And the sun's wonderful. Without the shining sun, we wouldn't have energy to live. We wouldn't be able to see where to go. It would be an incredibly difficult and depressing. And really, I think life would be unsustainable without the sun on this earth. And so the sun is wonderful and it's beautiful, but also has its issues, right? Like sometimes we don't get enough of it and sometimes we get too much of it. And then if you think about what the sun represents, just light shining in the darkness, like we would like more of that in our world, more moral light shining in the darkness and more light of hope shining in hopeless places. And the light of wisdom to help us walk and make the right decisions. It's like you take the temple, you take the sun, you take the moon. Here are all good things that are lacking. And sometimes there's corruption and sometimes there's decay. And we long for a world with a better light, right? A better temple, a better sun, a better moon. And that's the light that John describes for us. Verse 22, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And then verse 23, the glory of God illuminates the city and its lamp is the lamb. My friends, there's a lamp, lamb, illuminating the new heavens and the new earth. The perfect lamb of God was slain. And the reason that the way that we saw God's mercy was not only in the provision of the lamb, but the fact that the lamb bled, that's how we saw the love and the light of God. That's how we saw God's mercy is we saw a bleeding lamb. It was Jesus Christ who was slain. But in the new heavens, in the new earth, 
what comes from the lamb is the light of God. The, light, the merciful light of God will pour from his pores and we will see the new heavens and the new earth beautified and glorified and lit up with abundant light. There's not enough light in this world, but there will be super abundant light. The Lord God Almighty will illuminate the city and the lamp lamb will shine with the merciful love and light of God. It will be powerful and beautiful and deeply good, shining on every face, making all of us beautiful. In his epic, The Divine Comedy, Dante, the poet, describes, uh, I don't know, his avatar, Dante the Pilgrim, walking through different parts of reality. And he's descending to the lowest parts of hell and walking through this suffering earth and walks in, in many ways all the way up to the highest peak of heaven. And along the way, he's noticing either a lack of light or a superabundance of light. And so in hell, there's no light. It's so dark that when you get to the lowest parts of hell, it's like it's ice and it's dark and everything is so cold. And it's cold because there's no love. But the higher that Dante climbs into paradise, the more light there is and the more love there is. And in Canto One of Paradiso, the pilgrim Dante says this, glory from him who moves all things that are, penetrates the universe, and then shines back, reflected more in one part, less elsewhere. High in that sphere, which takes from him most light, I was and saw things that no one who descends knows how or ever can repeat. There's a way in which words fall short for how beautiful and full this light will be. Emmanuel will be the lamp lamb. And friends, he's shining even now, shining with merciful light on all of us, shining on every face that will look, look to him. And, and the thought of this light can pierce our hearts and make us homesick for it. But one day we will see the glory that Dante is describing and that John the Revelator saw. We will see the lamp lamp. Now here's the final feature that I want us to see in the world that we long for. And that's this, instead of false coercion, there will only be willing conversion. Instead of false uh, coercion, there will only be willing conversion. Now, the Cambridge Dictionary describes coercion as, quote, the use of force to persuade someone to do something they are unwilling to do. That's what coercion is. Now, read these verses with me and just notice if there's any trace of coercion. Verses 24 and following. The nations will walk by its light. This is the light of the lamp lamb. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never close by day because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Do you see any signs of coercion? There's not. There's none. Hallelujah. In our world, when kings march through gates of cities that aren't theirs, it's usually not a good sign. It's usually that they're on a power play or they're making a move and there's, they're forcing their way through the gates. Nation rising up against nation forcing their will, stealing and plundering and advancing their interests while trampling on the well-being of others. And usually it's in the name of all we're trying to do is liberate, all we're trying to do is recreate utopia. Now, one of the most powerful gates, my friends, of, in all the universe is the, hum, the gate of the human heart, I think. The ability of the human heart to say yes and open the gates of your heart or no. That's our God-given ability. And whenever we force that gate open, that's coercion. Now, usually we're not doing that violently, but we can manipulate those doors open, whether giving the cold shoulder or sweet talking or browbeating. Sometimes we use money or gifts to force the gate open. Other times we might lie or shade the truth to control somebody and force the gate open. Why do we do this to each other? Why do we have to control people? Usually we're trying to recreate Eden and, and get other people to cooperate with us. We want utopia. We want heaven so much we're heart sick for it that we're willing to put someone else through hell to make our world better. And that is false coercion. In verse 27, says, hey, when Emmanuel Jesus comes to dwell with us, it will end forever. Verse 27, nothing unclean will ever into it, 
nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. We are free. We are homesick for a a city, that is, that's free of false coercion. Now, do you notice that the kings of the earth in verse 24 came into the city of their own free will? They're bringing the glory and honor of their nations as a tribute. They're not being frog marched into the new heavens and the new earth. The new Jerusalem is so beautiful and so generous and so full of light. They couldn't help but bring their glory and honor into it, coming at the Lord's invitation. The gates of the city are open. And so are the hearts of the kings. This is willing conversion. You know, early in Revelation, Jesus says this. He makes this invitation. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Do you see in these words how respectful Jesus is to our capacity to say yes or no, to close the gate of our heart to him or to open it. He says, listen, I love you. Please allow me to enter into your kingdom so that you may one day enter into my kingdom. Listen, I know a guy once who ran for public office and in his first campaign, he did it the old fashioned way. He knocked on doors, just door after door, just knocking on doors. And if people open the door, He went in and had a conversation with them about his platform. If they closed the door, he went to the next door. And that's how he built his coalition. And it's just basically one door at a time. He ended up knocking on 10,000 doors, just that one campaign. Now, listen, imagine Emmanuel, God with us, coming to our world, knocking on doors, just one person at a time, saying, would you let me be Emmanuel, God with you? Would you let me come into your life? Would you let me be with you? Would you let me take away your loneliness? Would you let me shine my light into your darkness? Would you let me be your friend? Would you let me invite, would you like to come to my table? Just knocking, just door by door, heart by heart saying, I would like to be your God. I would like you to be my people. The people who swing wide the doors of their heart to let Emmanuel in are the ones who will one day pass through the gates of his city in the life to come. There's no false coercion. There's only willing conversion. It happens for these kings from all over the world. They've been converted. There's no more detestable things in their hearts. The Holy Spirit has taken it away. What about for you? Because it is such a big deal to say yes to this lamb. And say yes, come in, like shine your light in my little kingdom. Share your meal with me. Forgive my sin. Receive the tributes of my life and my labor. Receive me and my work into your kingdom. He's knocking on doors even this morning. And just Emmanuel, God with us, is building his city heart by heart, friend by friend. That's exactly where Emmanuel, God with us, wants to be. Heart by heart, friend by friend, building this new Jerusalem, this new bride, one person at a time. Do you carry a he life, a homesickness, a longing for the city to come? We're the sea of separation is no more, but there's a joyful marriage instead. Where the corrupt and dying sources of light and life give way to the lamp, whose light overflows with superabundant glory. Do you long, my friends? Do you have that he for that city where there's no coercion at all, where there's only willing conversion, willing and glad, joyful conversion? So do I. I long for that so much. Let's not hold back. Swing wide the gates. Let the king of glory come in, my friends. I plead with you. Let his light shine in your heart. His light is so good and beautiful and true. He'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's the king who won't coerce. So bring your glory and your honor to his altar this morning. Bring your hearts, lift them up to him. Emmanuel is not just the name of our church, my friends, but a living reality in our midst. So come to his table, eat with him, for in his presence you will find the fulfillment of every longing, the answer to every question, and the love that knows no bounds. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.